Today we have with us Thomas Turiano, an adventure consultant, author, speaker, and guitarist of Wilson, Wyoming. Welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. So you've lived in the vicinity of Jackson Hole for about 31 years and seem to really be a true modern man of the mountains. Uh, would you tell us about a bit about your work as an adventure consultant and author? Yeah, so I, I kind of got into this pursuit just through the, my passion, pa having a passion for being in the mountains. And uh, so I thought to myself, how can I, how can I turn this passion into a lifelong career? And so I, um, I moved to Jackson in 1985 and uh, started as a ski instructor at Snow King. And I trained as a ski instructor and a guide under Bill Briggs, who was the first person to ski down the Grand Teton, and uh, he also developed a really uh, amazing uh, ski instructor and guide training program. So I took his program for three years, and then I, uh, I uh, moved over to Jackson Hole Mountain Resort as a ski instructor, and about that time I also started doing more guiding. And my, uh, over the next 10, 15 years, my ski instruction went down to nothing and my guiding became my primary work. And in the process, I, um, I think I, you know, I was interest, always interested in going into the mountains, both on, you know, both hiking, climbing, and skiing, and, uh, sh and sharing that with my clients. And, um, and then it just kind of grew from there, you know, uh, sharing it through my books. Uh, and so since uh, my first book came out in 1995, and since then I've uh, produced uh, four others, so five total now. Wonderful. I know you've put a lot in, into them. Um, your second uh, award-winning book is this one, Select Peaks of Greater Yellowstone, a mountaineering uh guide and or history and guide excuse me and it's been very popular among both history lovers and mountaineers alike what inspired or uh, inspired you to write about this mountaineering history of the greater yellowstone region well first of all um, what inspired me to write the book period and then i'll get into the history sure um because they're sort of connected i i had around after my first book came out in 1995, I, I was thinking, well, what, you know, maybe I could do another book, and, and I was interested at the time in just peaks in general, and I, I had started doing a little more traveling, and I went around the northwest, and I saw, wow, there's a big peak there, there's a big peak there, there's a big peak there, what if I climbed all the peaks that caught my eye, the big ones, and wrote a book about that, so I, I, I was going to do you know, select peaks of the northwest. That's the original plan was to do that, and uh, I approached the Mountaineers Press, and they didn't really like the idea. But but they said, "How about a how about a book to, about your home home ground?" And I was like, "Oh well, okay, that's a good idea." But in about the same time, I was, I had some clients on a guided granite peak in Montana, and you know the the real inspiration hadn't hit me yet. To, to do this book until I was sitting on the summit of Granite Peak with these clients and looking out across the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and seeing, oh yeah, look, there's one big peak, there's another big peak, there's another big peak. There's, and, it, and each of the big peaks sort of caught my eye. It's like, wow, you know, if I, you know, life is short, if I could only climb 50 peaks, I can see them right in front of me right now. Right. <laughs> and uh, so from that moment, I decided I would start to climb those peaks. And I did almost immediately. Just uh, started, you know, driving around the, the region and ticking off these the highest peaks. And then from every peak that I climbed, I could see other ones. And and uh, and then as a result, I ended up with 107. And then, you know, in the process of doing this, I. Um, you know, I've always been interested in history, and, and with my first book, Teton Skiing, there was quite a bit of history in that book as well about the, the history of skiing in Jackson. And I feel like history is important to include in any guidebook because 
it um, you know it, it basically it, it shows modern enthusiasts the, the style and, and the motivations in which people the pioneers uh, did the, the same things that they're they're doing now and if it's almost like if somebody somebody earlier does something earlier than you in, in a style, in a pure style, then that sort of sets the standard on how you should try to do it as well. And so I, I think uh, I, I like to include history to show people that um, you know you can do things in a pure style because you know in modern day there's all these machines that we have that help make things easier, like snowmobiles, and ATVs, and four-wheel drive vehicles and um, helicopters <laughs> yeah. and um, they, they really take away from the, the, the challenge and the connection to those earlier pioneers. So that's kind of what I was shooting for with writing history was to, to, to inspire a connection with the early the, the pioneers and, and the style and motivation that they had to do these things. Wonderful. Now, can you explain to us who might not know otherwise what exactly mountaineering is? Yeah, to me, mountaineering is um, it's having a goal or an intention, setting that goal, setting that intention, and uh, in the mountains, and 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 the goal could be anything from you know obviously climbing a peak to climbing a wall to traversing around mountain range or across a mountain range to going up to trap beaver you know okay. <laughs> but the, the common thing in mountaineering in all these pursuits is you are getting off the beaten path you're leaving the trail and you are using your own judgment and skills to uh, you know to achieve your goal and that Included with that would be, you know, essential. An essential thing to include in that is always being aware of the balance between risk and reward. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, you want to climb this peak, but the weather's coming in, you know, and you can see that if you continue, you could get struck by lightning. So, that's just having that awareness. Okay, how how valuable is it? To me to climb that peak <laughs> is it worth my life right you know probably hopefully not yeah. <laughs> but that's up for each person to decide and it's different for everybody okay so this is a pretty broad term but um... yeah i like it as a broad term some people have told me oh well what you do isn't mountaineering <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> but, I, I think I like your term though because it also helps cover a variety of time periods too mm -hmm. because not everybody uses the mountains in the same way mm -hmm. There's similar intentions but yeah times have changed so would you consider the trappers and traders then of early 1800s to be um, mountaineers yeah I, I uh, when I wrote select peaks I, I tried to I kind of saw that similarities like okay maybe I should try to um, uh, connect the, the early definition of mountaineers, which in, in the 1830s, this was this new generation of trapper, basically when they trapped out the valleys like here, uh, no beavers left down here, no beaver left, they, um, you know, they had to go up in the higher canyons and, and mountains to, 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 to hunt beaver. And so the, there became this new um, designation of trapper called the mountaineers, and um, and I and you know I think it, it's a similar it's a similar pursuit because they had one they had to go in the mountains, two they had to find the way up and and mm -hmm. use their skills and and judgment to to survive and find their way. Um, so I tried to draw that that comparison to modern mountaineering where. You're leaving the beaten path and heading up in the hills okay. on your own. Um, now it seems like though the majority of local mountaineering advances seem to have taken place more in the later 1800s and uh, up through the mid 1900s with government expeditions, scientific surveys, and adventure-loving individuals. 
What would you say some of the biggest challenges faced were in this early mountaineering? Well, the, uh, the trapping, the trappers and the, um, the prospectors, they had, they, you know, they didn't have uh, the benefit of the railroads uh, or big steamships. Some of them did, but um, you know, they had to basically walk or ride their horse all the way from St. Louis all the way to the mountains. Right. And then when the railroads went in, and there was one in southern Wyoming and one in southern Montana, that basically suddenly, you know, these government expeditions could get right in there uh, and, you know, bring horses on the trains and or maybe they got their horses locally, but, uh, you know, they could, they could bring equipment on the train and then do sort of a, a mini expedition, though, they, you know, a mini expedition in those days was going from Bozeman to Yellowstone, whereas today we go from, you know, the parking lot to a little peak in Yellowstone, right. <laughs> but uh, uh, and so um, their their challenges for the the macro approach weren't as big as the trappers or the prospectors. Um, their challenges, the government expeditions challenges, were mostly uh, you know because they were cart cartographic and uh, geologic expeditions. They mm -hmm. had to carry. You know, they would use horses in the valleys and, you know, as far as they could up these canyons and they'd set up a camp and then they'd have to carry this heavy survey equipment up to the peaks. And so some of the, a lot of those earlier uh, topographic expeditions in the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, those guys were real burly because they had huge loads, 50 to 80 pound back boxes, they would, you know, with just shoulder straps and a head strap and carry them to the peak and then spend the afternoon and into the night on the peak depending on what era they were survey surveying and then they would descend in you know in the morning right. <laughs> or in the dark wow. <laughs> so that was challenging I think <laughs> what about the um, the people that were more you know beyond the government expeditions up into the the mid uh, 1900s yeah. that later generation of early explorers, if you will. Yeah. Was there something in particular that they were really facing a challenge with? Yeah, so that 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 kind of, uh, that um, sort of recreational mountaineering really started kind of in the 20s, but there were a few in the in the teens. In fact, the first ascent of, um, of Gannett Peak was done in, in the in the uh, 1910s uh, by, by some people from, from Du Bois. Okay. And, um, but then the, the real renaissance happened in the early 20s and mid 20s when mountaineers from Colorado came up and they drove up you know to Jackson they drove up to Pinedale to Du Bois and they you know they didn't have guidebooks obviously they didn't have uh, uh, you know really much knowledge about uh, you know what they were going to go climb but they did have the maps from the surveyors. Okay, so it wasn't uh, a complete blank slate. It wasn't a complete blank slate. And there were some trails labeled on those maps. Uh, in particular, I'm talking about the, um, the 19, uh, right around 1900, a map came out for the Tetons. Uh, and around, uh, uh, I guess around the same time, there was a map for Gannett and Fremont Peak area. Okay. And those maps did have some old Indian routes that were you know, that they could follow into the mountains. But I think, I think, for example, like Kenneth and Kenneth Henderson, who uh, who was basically the first guidebook author for the winds. He he wrote an article in uh, I believe in the, uh, the 30s about uh, or maybe it was the 20s about um, climbing in the Wind River Range and. He described the route, the approach routes, and some of the major peaks and uh, major peaks to climb. And he, um, I believe he, he did a lot of research to get that information, to get those, you know, to figure out where those approaches were. And and when he did his trips, he seemed to nail it. He went, he walked right up Horse Ridge. You know, he mm -hmm. he knew right where to go. Uh, you know, using the maps and probably sat in in the coffee shop in Dubois. Talking to the, the 
yeah, the, locals. the locals, yeah, okay. to, to find those routes. Um, so their, yeah, their challenge was just, I think, to do their homework like that. Mm -hmm. But those guys were so fit and so skilled that once they got in the mountains, you know, the, the yeah. peaks were easy for them. Or, you know, not easy, but they were fun. Right, and yep. they weren't, they weren't the route, they weren't starting from complete scratch, too, with the route, right. so that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of gear were these mountaineers relying on? Yeah, so, well, uh, one of Ke Kenneth Henderson's partners, this guy Robert Underhill, had climbed in Europe. And um, he, he brought with him new skills on how to uh, safe, you know, more safely climb rock. And uh, he brought over the, you know, the, the, the use of the piton to anchor and more advanced rope belaying skills and rappelling skills. And uh, so they were using, you know, just this uh, old um, wound rope, I don't even know what you call it, but, uh, um, and, uh, you know, pretty rudimentary pitons. Europe had a big influence in terms yeah. of being able to approach these more wall climbs and mm -hmm. such. Okay. Yeah. Um, what would you say your favorite Wind River um, range mountaineering story is? Yeah, I like, I, I really enjoy the, the Fremont, the John C. Fremont climb of Fremont Peak oh. because the, the journals and the, the different journal accounts of the story bring out the personalities in these guys and they're, they're all from, from different walks of life. Some were, you know, German, some were French, some were American. And they all had their different views of mountains and what was a civilized expedition. And, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and there were some great characters and um, and how they interplayed as they approached the mountains. Uh, you know, the, Charles Preuss, who was their cartographer, uh, you know, he said, when I compare this, what I see to what I know in the Alps, it's like turning my view from a face of a beautiful young woman to the face of a wrinkled old lady. <laughs> oh, man. Poor so, wind. But then he, then as they approached the mountains, he changed his tune and he kind of said, that, wow, this actually is pretty beautiful and I'm happy to be here. And, um, and he became, he kind of got excited to, to climb the peak that they were headed for, which was Fremont Peak, unnamed at the time. But it was interesting how Fremont, the leader of the expedition, John Fremont, uh, you know, he, that was really what he wanted to do. He had other charges, uh, you know, from his superiors. You have to, you know, check out South Pass. You need to do this and that. You got to go over Union Pass. He didn't really care about any of that stuff. He just wanted to climb the highest peak. <laughs> and uh, so he was very driven and, you know, uh, they... I think they took a day to get from Boulder Lake up to their camp and then they're like well let's just climb it from here it looks so close and of course they they were all exhausted and had altitude sickness and, and couldn't make it the first day so they just laid down on the rocks and they sent somebody back to get some supplies <laughs> and the person came back up that evening with supplies and nursed them back to health and then they went for it the next day Kit Carson was involved, and Kit Carson and John Fremont always butted heads. And I think in this case, uh, you know, on that first day, Kit Carson was like, let's go for it, you know, and he took off running, and nobody could keep up with him. And, and so the party split up, and people were, you know, laying down on the rocks, as they kept saying. And, uh, and then he was dismissed, I believe, that, that he's like, you're out of here. You know, let's we're gonna put this guy Basel in charge, and Basel was the guy who went down to get the supplies and bring them back up. So Basel led the next day, and he kind of kept people together. He was a Frenchman, and they went up uh, the uh, west face of Fremont, which is much more imposing than the south side, which they had attempted the previous day. And Preuss had actually made it pretty far up Fremont Peak that first day, but then he slipped on some snow and tumbled down some rocks and he oh, was geez. in bad shape so 
Basel actually went up to rescue him as well. <laughs> well, it seems like it'd be really fun to read those accounts and yeah. see those person, you know, human nature coming out. <laughs> but it's just amazing they made it, you know, that, it, yeah. that they persevered and, uh, you know, with just a couple of bacon sandwiches or whatever they had. And, and then the real funny part of it was to get to the summit. Fremont sees, uh-oh, there's, there's a higher peak to the north, but we won't mention that. <laughs> <laughs> Gannet peak. Referring to Gannet, yes. Yeah. So why do you think it's important for people to um, care about this history of mountaineering? Again, I think getting back to that idea of um, establishing kind of the style and the, and the motivation, uh, I think it's important that, that we teach mountaineering history the way it happened so that today with all of these temptations like helicopters and snowmobiles that we just take a close look at the way other people did it and and sort of pay homage to that like you know uh, they had a lot of a lot of guts and a lot of you know really a, a lot of strength to get up there and you know with the equipment they had and, and the distances they had to cover and for us to just you know skim over that with a snowmobile just doesn't seem right to me. <laughs> yeah. We have yeah. a lot of lessons to be learned from them. Yes, yeah, so we have a lot of lessons to learn from what they went through. Now, mountaineering is still really popular, of course, in the Wind Rivers today. Is there a um, personal story you'd like to share with us of mountaineering, either good or bad, in uh, these mountains? Yeah, I've had a lot of great experiences. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the Probably the scariest experience I had in the Wind Rivers was uh, climbing Pingora uh, and being one pitch from the top of the northeast face and getting caught in a big snowstorm oh, wow. and just having to sit there huddled on this little ledge for, I think we sat there for two hours and hoping that it would clear, but it didn't. And so we had really no choice and at this point we were already starting to go hypothermic. And so we had no choice but just to do, I don't know, 10 rappels to get down. And that is so dangerous. The rock is covered with ice and snow and you're cold and you can't, your fingers don't function. That's, that's how people really get in trouble, but we, we made it. <laughs> uh, and uh, then of course, as soon as we got down, it was clear. <laughs> <laughs> if we just waited another three hours, it would have been fine. <laughs> then, um, you know, one of my greatest trips in the winds was a, a traverse of the range, ski traverse of the range, climbing Gannet, skiing Gannet, and, or part of Gannet, and then skiing out the other side. And, and that was in 1989 or 90 uh, with my friend Tom Bennett. And um, we, we started in Dubois. This was in early April. and. You know, the idea is just to get on snow as quick as you can and, and hope, hope that the snow is nice and firm and you can cruise. And on the east side of the range, it's rarely nice and firm. You, you, you pretty much, you're going to have a day of misery getting through that. And that's the way it was. It was, when we hit snow, it was kind of rotten. And so we wallowed through rotten snow and then, you know, for several hours and then finally got to good firm snow. And then we could just cruise up, this, up Dinwiddie Valley and uh, had a beautiful day to summit. Uh, we summited at dawn, so we left at two, left our camp at two in the morning. We just wanted to be on the summit at dawn, which was really spectacular. We just, we literally timed it perfectly. We arrived and then the sun peaked out. And um, this was, we were skiing with leather boots and 220 skis and, you know, narrow 58 underfoot or something. So we didn't ski off the summit, we skied off the saddle mm -hmm. uh, at the top of the gooseneck couloir and skied down, down the glacier, just beautiful, and then skinned up to Dinwiddie Pass. And then just, we had, uh, from Dinwiddie Pass to uh, our car down on the road up to uh, Elkhart Park, it took us, we did it in three hours or something like oh, that. Oh, wow. <laughs> because it was so fast. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so that was really neat. Yeah, because that's about 15 and a half miles, 16 miles, somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you having you here today. And if anybody's interested in their own adventure consultant, got 
Thomas Turiano.